so many of the things that otherwise just pass as playing the notes on the page just a mechanical exercise, how to execute those, how to make sure you're playing in tune. Sometimes that is, uh, is what musicians think their task is. Uh, don't make mistakes, make it as beautiful as possible. When you understand the context within which the music was composed, the aesthetic priorities, the sorts of even cultural tensions that are uh, articulated in the music. The uh, ability to perform, uh, I think, rises exponentially. To take something like the Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, for instance, we're very accustomed to thinking of the last movement uh, as the Ode to Joy. There is a hymn that many people sing in church services in English uh, that just has the tune. And the, the use of the Ninth Symphony uh, politically uh, for purposes of celebration, such as the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, has made people hear that piece in exclusively celebratory terms. Now, in order to hear it that way, you have to ignore a lot of the things that made that piece so difficult to play when it was first performed. Uh, it was regarded even as unperformable for uh, quite a long time after the premiere. Um, and it was thought to be that way, not just because of the enormous performing forces that it takes, but also because of the ruptures that take place, because of the really shocking events. We begin the symphony with a dissonance that screams after a very, very placid a beautiful third movement. The scream erupts. Now, we're used to that because we've heard the Ninth Symphony millions of times. We're also accustomed to the fact that as it tries to come to a conclusion, it keeps almost stopping and then breaking down, almost stopping, then breaking down, almost stopping, breaking down, and finally just shoving for conclusion. Now, this is not the way a piece ought to work. And I think when you're able to talk to people who are performing, who are conducting, but even you know the person who is playing uh, last chair, second fiddle, uh, to understand uh, the way that Beethoven is trying, in a way, to, to perform once again the confidence he had in the Enlightenment when he wrote the Eroica Symphony. Uh, but he is now riddled with doubt. Many things have happened in Europe uh, and in his own life uh, in, the, in the course of the intervening years. Uh, and so these places where the piece almost falls apart, where it is almost ripped down the middle, are as important as the places where it seems to be completely coherent. Uh, it has to be a balance between those, between uh, the rejoicing and the hymn singing and the places where it suddenly breaks off into nowhere with question marks hanging all around. Now you can perform the Ninth Symphony, uh, uh, and many people do, by trying to push through those question marks, trying to make uh, some kind of smooth entity of the whole movement. And that certainly works well for celebration. But uh, the impact that you can have when you perform the doubt, when you perform the desire, uh, and yet the doubts that this world genuinely still exists, uh, is, uh, is just extraordinary. And I think anyone going into a performance of a piece that is that complex needs to have ways of thinking about why this movement is shaped so very strangely, or even have it be pointed out to them that the movement is shaped strangely because we're so familiar with it. We don't even notice anymore. I sometimes tell my students who want there to be a single right way of performing a piece of classical music. Uh, that, that is probably the wrong question. There have been hundreds, thousands of productions of Hamlet, each one 
with a completely different take on that very, very complex text. Each one imagining a different motivation for Hamlet, a different motivation for Ophelia. And we go to see productions of Hamlet not because it will duplicate the one that Laurence Olivier did on film, but because it will give us new insights. It will cause us to see not only Hamlet differently, but will allow us to experience our own lives in a different way. And that's what the performance of a great piece of classical music ought to do also. That's why I think that we have to think about what is being said? What, what is the nature of uh, the meaning of these pieces? And how is that meaning being articulated in the very smallest details of articulation, of bowing, of, of dynamic uh, uh, marks, or, or anything else? I think all of these things must be brought together.